What's up everyone, Mike here from The Art of Guitar, here with the Brian May Technique video. A lot of people have been requesting this, and I just went and saw the Bohemian Rhapsody movie, so I'm a little bit inspired at the moment, and uh, I was reminded of all the techniques that Brian May has that over the years I've been really trying to emulate and add to my own style. So uh, here are my favorite techniques, and by the way, I was going to go out and try to find a guitar that was closer to Brian May's guitar. He has a, like a one-of-a-kind guitar, so uh, I figured after a little bit of uh, contemplating that, it probably wouldn't be the best idea because that would give people the impression that they'd need a guitar similar to his to play his techniques, but it's not true. So I'm actually gonna be using my SG and my JAG today just to show you that you could play his stuff on any guitar, obviously, and it could still sound good. So, all right, let's get started. Okay, a lot of us know what arpeggios are when it comes to chords. And it's cool when you're the rhythm guitar player and you wanna fill some space, but you don't wanna play big chunky chords to just separate them. And here's an example of arpeggiating a chord. But what Brian May does, which I really enjoy about his guitar in particular, he uses his tremolo bar quite a bit. So what he does at the end of the arpeggio is he modulates it by uh, just adding a little bit of his trem bar. So he goes. Okay, it's time to switch to the SG. At least it's a little bit more uh, like Brian May's guitar as far as the color goes. Okay, so what we're gonna do now are talk about the triple harmonies he likes to do. Very orchestral sounding, and in this particular example, it's just a trill harmonized three ways. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna play all three parts separate now, and then uh, I'm actually gonna add them in post-production so you can hear what they sound like together, okay? So I'm just gonna take this trill. and add it with this trill. And then this trill as well. Should sound like this. Two, three, four. Uh, we're gonna do a cascading pattern across the minor pentatonic here, starting at the 14th fret, and it goes like this. What makes this so fun to play is that the combination of pull-offs and the way he plays it makes it feel like it's just rolling. That's why I call it cascading. It feels like it just keeps cascading downward as you get to the final note. And it's a combination of hammer-ons and pull-offs all across this blue scale. Of course, he doesn't use his pinky very much, so he would go like this. A good way to practice this, I like to overdo vibrato when I'm practicing and practice real even uh, bends up and down. And then as I get smaller and smaller, it speeds up, but it stays even. So also when you're speeding up, you are not gonna keep doing the full step bends when you're practicing this. Bring it down to a half step, also quarter step's important. So here's an example if you did a whole step bend uh, for vibrato practice. <laughs> So my only objective now is just to get it even. As you start to speed it up. See, I made it a half step that time. Quarter step is even smaller. Sometimes it's not even noticeable uh, as far as when you're really just listening to it in a full context, but on its own you could hear the, the modulation happening. So practice the vibrato in three steps, full step, half step, and quarter step. And just make sure it's real even and get it as fast as you can and you'll get close to what he does. Of course everybody has their own signature vibrato, I'm going to make a whole video on that as well. But uh, right now just that'll get you started. So we're going to go to the 17th fret second string and I'm going to pre-bend it a whole step. And the reason I want to do that is so I achieve the note that's a whole step above it in sound. But I'm able to drop it down and then bring it back up to create a vibrato effect at the end of it. So it's kind of like this. <laughs> So if I just went straight to the note that I'm trying to bend to, I wouldn't be able to do that. It would just be a straight note. But if you pre-bend a whole step underneath up to that note and then start to do vibrato, then you can do it. It's a 
cool tool to have. Because Queen is so orchestrated at times, uh, you know, they can go anywhere from a real gritty rock band sound to complete orchestration and uh, even opera sounds, obviously. What I notice about Brian May is he does what I call violin scale runs. And I don't see a ton of guitar players doing straight up scales, ascending and descending, but uh, he likes to do that. So all you gotta do is take a scale and blatantly play it and uh, achieve the effect. <laughs> And if you harmonize them, they sound even more orchestral. There's times when there's so much going on in the rhythm, whether it's piano, you know, the whole band's playing, and you don't want to take up huge space with power chords or full chords, so you might want to play single note rhythms, which is very effective in Queen and how he uses it. So you could do something like this. <laughs> That might have been too big if you used power chords. Even though I think it really sounds good, especially with that tone. So sometimes playing more than one note is too much, even though it sounded good in that example, but I wasn't playing with a full band. So uh, don't be afraid to play single note rhythms sometimes, okay? Every guitar player has patterns that they're really used to. And I noticed when I was watching some of his instruction videos and listening to a lot of his solos that he does this particular motif a lot. And I just call it musical shredding because he's playing fast, but it's in a musical way. He's using uh, a descending pattern, but he throws in this little uh, hammer on pull off thing. So I'll do it slow first of all. You probably recognize this lick. And if I slow it down, you'll see the pattern emerge. And it's easy if you're practicing to just get that pattern flowing th across all six strings so you could keep extending it. And so on if you wanted to keep going. But uh, he decides to stop right after the third string gets played. And it's a really great lick, musical, and it fits the situation really well. All right, let's continue with this same kind of concept with the same solo. Staccato playing is a huge part of Brian May's sound. So he gets those real sharp hits when he plays sometimes. And a lot of people, when they first see that, they're not really sure what's going on. But what I do is I pick a note and then I immediately stop it with the other side of the pick. So if you climb and you do that every single time, creates a real uh, tight rhythmic sound as you're playing and it has traction is what I like to call it. So it just feels good as you hear that, as opposed to if you didn't do it. It's a little too smooth. So sometimes you really want to choke those notes using the staccato technique to uh, let them poke out a little bit more. A lot of my students ask, how you play rhythms and then throw little leads in between the, the chords or the power chords in this case. A really cool way to do it is to use major pentatonic. Once again, we go into depth with that on the website, but here I'm just gonna play a power chord and I'm gonna play a little bit of a pentatonic lick going into the next chord, all right? And this is what he does for one of the songs. <laughs> So you see, it's not that difficult because you're just sliding up a couple frets and doing a little pentatonic lick, but it fills the space nicely. It's a go cool thing to throw in. So that's based off this first chord I'm doing, the B flat power chord. And from there, I'm just going those notes just in different ways or he he uses them not me and you can do that with any power chord it's sort of a nice little secret box shape that you could put above any uh, power chord that you're doing so if, let's say if you've been if you're up here Slash chords are huge in Queen's music. I'm sure a lot of it comes from Freddie's piano playing. A lot of piano players will play slash chords. On guitar, it's fun to just do a few little changes and get these sounds. So, for example, you could take like a G5 open chord. And then keep the bass note with that middle finger, the G. 
and then just take your index finger now and let's lay it across like we're playing an A chord, A major. We get this. You may have heard that before, so it's kind of like a Tom Petty chord. Anyways, now you have A over G. It's a great sound. You can go to, let's say, D major. Take your thumb, play an F sharp underneath it all. Or you can bring it up to a G with your thumb. That's D over G, sounds cool. Back to D over F sharp. Back to regular G. A over G. Back to G. It's fun to practice just messing around with slash chords. You could take any open chord that you're used to and then just change the bass notes and see the effect of it. You'd be kind of surprised what you can get. Almost played Wonderwall there. Okay, another Randy Rhodes reference. Uh, we're gonna do some pedal tone triads and these are Kind of interesting because you're going to be playing chords as triads on the second, third, and fourth strings. And so we're going to have an A, E, D, and back to A. It's a lot like Crazy Train. So what we're going to end up with then are these triads. But we're going to add the open A string underneath all of them. So this sort of blends into what we were talking about with slash chords. So we have A over A. We're going to have E over A. D over A. And back to A over A. You don't have to say A over A, just say A. Okay. Brian May has found a really great way for his notes to stand out and he does what I call the cry bend and that's just a particular way you play a bend in his case. Uh, what he does is he'll hit a note and when he bends it up he doesn't just bend it right away. He sort of takes his time scooping it up but he does it quickly so it all sounds like a contradiction but here's what I mean. If you just did a slow bend it would sound like this. If you did a fast bend and he has a way of doing it fast, but slow at the same time. So it's like the curvature goes like this, and then it goes like that. Instead of going like this in a diagonal manner, it scoops up like that. So you get this. So a little bit different than normal bends. If you did that normal, it would sound like this. But with that little extra pause before the scoop, you get some more emotion out of it. I don't know exactly how to put it into words. People think playing on the beat all the time and being really perfect is a good idea, but eventually you want to throw off the, the feel a little bit. In this case, it gives uh, this particular lick a little more traction. I love that word. But as we're climbing up, uh, I'm basically pausing just a little bit before each note to slow it down, kind of like putting on the brakes before we get to the end. And it creates a cool effect. Here's the, the lick without slowing it down or without uh, playing behind the beat. Even with staccato. Still pretty normal sounding. Now, if I were to play a little behind the beat, which means I sort of drag it down a little bit, gives it a different feel. It's a little bit of a different feel. Like I said, if you keep it straight, it's got one sensation. If you uh, slow it down just a little bit, dip a little bit behind when you're practicing with a band or with a metronome, and uh, you'll find some really cool effects if you do that in both rhythm and lead. When Metallica covered Still Cold Crazy, I thought it was a really cool riff. Uh, I was pretty young, so I didn't know Queen had done it first. So when I finally learned Queen's version of it, it was still very heavy, uh, just very different. And I really liked the syncopated climb that they do during the riff, and it's actually pretty difficult to do in time when you're first learning it. And that's uh, the whole idea of syncopated rhythms throws it off. It means you're playing on the upbeats of everything. So you get this. <laughs> Thank you. 
See how strange those up hits are at the end? The dilemma for guitar players is when that happens, do you use upstrokes, do you use downstrokes? I just kind of go by what feels right right now, but when I first did it, I just did it all upstrokes just to really keep on that upbeat because it can be kind of hard to do when you're going fast. You've heard it with Tony Iommi and a couple other guitar players where they just start to play two solos at once and uh, it just sounds a little bit chaotic and crazy. What Brian does is he'll engage a delay to play a little bit after what he does and it sounds like two guitars are playing all of a sudden. <laughs> So that's just a delay set a little bit later than when I hit the note, so it sounds like this. You can play back and forth with that. And in his instruction video, he's actually using three different amps with three delay units, sending one to each amp. It's really crazy. Uh, I'm just using an effect plugin, so I'm kind of cheating, but just throw on some delay and it can really enhance your solos and make them sound a little bit more crazy. I don't want to say as simple, but it's not that difficult to do one pattern over and over again and then just move it up chromatically. And that's what he's doing in this uh, case. It's kind of fun to throw this in because as you move up, you're going to get some crazy sounding notes. But uh, it's a cool result. Just go like this. Take any pattern. I'll just do this one for now. And start walking it up one fret at a time. It can be more difficult than you think to drag the, the last finger back uh, behind like this. Sometimes it doesn't want to follow at the same rate. So really go slow it in the beginning. So that's what I would do to start off practicing. Notice I'm using these three fingers. Typically I would do this, but Brian May is a big advocate of three fingers, or these three fingers mostly. So start to smoothen it out. You could really get flying, and pretty soon your hand just moves up real systematically. That's what you want to go for. All right, if you want to make your solo sound a little bit more, I don't know, flashy, Throw in some trills because you get a little bit more bang for your buck because you're really staying in one spot and just going back and forth between two notes. And uh, you could do that all over the pentatonic scale like he does in one particular solo. So start off with this concept. And then just start to put them together using, you know, different methods of bends. Uh, sometimes you just want to do something like this. So that'd be a slowed down version of what he does, but you get the idea. I'm just doing pretty typical pentatonic licks, but I'm adding a lot of trills to fill up the space a little bit more. Here's a little faster. And as you speed up, you just start to sound more and more like a kind of a shredder, but you're still staying in this kind of simple pentatonic pull off process. So. All right, on the website we teach pinch harmonics, and that's where you use the side of your thumb with a pick to really get some squeal sounds happening. And uh, it's pretty simple to do after a while uh, on the lower strings. But when you get to the higher strings and the higher frets, it gets really difficult to do these pinch harmonics uh, accurately every time. So my advice is to move the pick around a lot the right hand or the picking hand, whatever hand you are, and find the sweet spot for, for most of the notes. In this case, on this guitar, uh, it's gonna be right above the front pickup. And so I start to experiment a little bit to really find where it is, but uh, I encourage you to do so as well. Try to hit some really high notes and see what happens. <laughs> I right, found a couple of them. That one note in Bohemian Rhapsody is really hit or miss. So it takes a lot of practice to be able to hit that note. Sometimes you have to play four notes really fast over and over again. This is a lot like a journey lick that I've heard. 
many, many times in my life. And uh, when you start to play it, it goes back and forth. You have to develop a really strong picking hand for this. So just take four notes and see if you can play them over and over and over again in a circle and uh, keep it accurate and see what speed you can hit. You have to go pretty fast to play uh, this particular queen lick. <laughs> So after a while, you just get in this real flow. It, take, it took me many years to play something that smooth because I used to just get real choppy and my pick would go out of control or my fingers weren't keeping up or something. So lots of metronome work, okay? Uh, just set a metronome and play this for hours. Until one day, it's all just going to click and it's going to feel like automatic. But it takes a long time usually for that to happen. And then he also does speed pull-offs. So if you have four notes, you can also do them as pull-offs. It's half the work for your right hand, but twice the work for your left hand, because you actually have to pluck each string. So you get this. So slow, you see it's kind of simple looking. Then you start speeding it up. And he also uses speed pull-offs when he's doing a lot of these licks up here. So he might combine some and just double up like... So, great way to double your speed uh, without having to do too much picking, and it sounds really good. I was watching his instructional video, which is on YouTube. I recommend checking it out. It's awesome. And he does this really cool pre-bend that just rolls off the lick that he's doing. So he's got this going on. And what I love about this is the previous note that he plays before he does the, the pre-bend is here at the 6th fret, so we're playing a C-sharp, going back to a C, bending in a half step so it's a C-sharp, and then dropping it. Creates this kind of effect. Pretty cool sound. You can also do that with a whole step if you want to use it in your own circumstance. You can hit, for example, D, go back to the C, bend it a whole step, like a pre-bend, and then drop it down. A little more difficult. And if you haven't done a lot of bends with your index finger, it's going to be pretty sore the next day. I promise. A lot of guitar players are interested in slide guitar. You'll notice that Brian may use a slide sometimes. Uh, but I, what I really don't like to do is have to retune my entire guitar just to do slide. So I really like the fact that Brian uses standard slide tuning a lot. Uh, standard tuning slide, I should say. And that breaks down to if you know your bar chord, we call it the second form bar chord, and you move it around. For example, if you're in A, you could just be... Well, you could take the slide and just cover what the ring finger is doing right here and get a cool slide sound without having to think about it too much. So instead of going like this, we're going to go. And what comes with doing that is you start to slide around as you do it. You find some really cool sounding actual slide legs. So it's a very elementary way of looking at slide, but it's a fun way to get started. He also does tapping, surprisingly. Uh, he talks about it in one of his videos. And he uses a really cool technique where he uses his tapping finger as a plucking finger as well to get the lick started. Kirk Hammett does this as well. You get this going on. So you see how I couldn't just start off like a hammer-on? I wanted to pluck a note. So you could take your tapping finger and actually swipe it across the string, kind of like a pick would, to get the note started. And then from there he does a hammer-on with his ring finger, bends it up and does another tap. So this is both plucking and tapping with the same finger. <laughs> It's 
cool effect, especially if you do the bend and tap and then shake the bending finger, you get a great little vibrato out of that. It's easy to just categorize leads and rhythms separately, but sometimes a lead can become a rhythm if just repeated. At the beginning of this song, you get this kind of lead sounding thing. <laughs> Just play it a bunch of times in the beginning, it becomes a rhythm riff. It's similar to a lot of what Angus Young does in the beginning of a lot of songs where it's uh... You might know that riff. Uh, it's kind of the similar idea. I'm sure you'll know this sound. This is a great way to take two chords and bounce between them quickly. I call it the Stones chord change. And that's where you're going to create one chord, in this case A, way up here. And then we're going to hammer on a couple fingers to create an inverted version of D. And then you go together. If you move it around, you get sort of a classic rock kind of cliche sound. But Brian uses it up here. If the bass player wrote a really cool riff, why distract from it by doing something completely different? Uh, sometimes you just want to follow the bass line. In this case, uh, the, the bass part is so cool, just follow it with the guitar. <laughs> Brian May has such great rhythm. He can do the funky stuff. Uh, sometimes when you want the, the song to have more of a, I hate to say disco-y sound, but funky disco-y sound, what you could do is you could start to rake the strings while you play your chords and you get this nice little funk strum sound. So all I'm doing is I'm playing the chord as a bar chord here and then releasing the tension and just doing some rhythmic strums between them. Another way to do it is just to mute all the strings. Just get some really good rhythm going and then add the chord. Let's do some harmonized bends. This is gonna be in four tiers. It's gonna be a little bit crazy. First note I'm gonna bend up is going to be F, whole step up. We're gonna drop down to D, we're gonna bring half step. A half step. And the crazy one. This F, we're gonna go whole step here. It's just crazy to bend a low string that del that deliberately. All right, if we put them all together using post-production, we're gonna get this. So hopefully I was able to overdub the other bends successfully. Uh, I guess we'll see. Saw my friend do this at a gig the other day. His name's Terry, great guitar player around here. And it's a cool way to spice up your pentatonic playing. If you're doing a lot of minor pentatonics, sometimes it's fun to add the major third. If you don't know your intervals, uh, run to the website for that. But it's where you take your normal pentatonic and you get this going on. And when you get to that third string, instead of playing the minor third interval, we're going to use the major third interval, but we're going to trill it. And you'll hear this kind of thing going on. It's an easy way to spice up a pentatonic scale, and uh, in the case of Crazy Little Thing Called Love, it's, uh, it really catches the beat in a cool way. We can't forget about rakes, because I was talking about earlier, his lead playing has a lot of traction to it, it's going to be the word of the day, and a cool way to start off a solo with traction is to do rakes, so you're meeting the strings, and you're going across them, like you're sweeping across with dead strings until you get to your goal note. So see how it gives it a little bit of, of roughness in the beginning? I would rake every note if I could get away with it. And then another thing that I, I noticed he was doing, this didn't really hit me till I looked at the tab, 
is he'll play each note, but he'll uh, deaden it by doing what we did earlier with the clean rhythm rakes that we were doing, or the uh, clean rhythm mutes that we were doing. Just do it on individual strings and you get a great effect off that. <laughs> So muting like we did rhythm wise, but now in single strings. All right, everyone, that was a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully you can use some of these techniques, like I said, for your own uh, style. Uh, enhance what you already do. It's what I, why I like to do these videos for you. And uh, once again, uh, thanks to Brian May for all his influence in my life and uh, for everything he continues to do. And I'll catch you guys later. Check out that Bohemian Rhapsody movie if you can. It's pretty good. All right, guys. Catch you later. Thanks.